Good evening. I'm Frank Kaufman. I'm the president of the Settlement Project. The Settlement Project has a number of emphases in its work, one of which is the protection and preservation of those mediating institutions needed to maintain and, and prosper in a free and open society. Uh, these institutions include uh, such areas as media, education, corporate boards and corporate culture, big tech and social media, electoral politics, and political activism. All of these are free participa participatory arenas of human striving that are required to be healthy and strong and clear and well-guided in order for free and open societies to survive and to prosper. One of the most important of these institutions is family. Western free societies are constantly under assault and attack, both from foreign powers and from ideological forces that would seek to erode and diminish and undermine the bases for these institutions to function in a healthy and constructive way. In the arena of family, there is a very strong movement surrounding issues related to gender. There has arisen in recent times strong advocacy for the defense of gender fluidity and gender and transgenderism. Today we have with us a research scholar who has conducted a seven-part series or has produced and published a seven-part series on the medical and scientific roots of transgenderism. This is Dr. Jonathan Wells. Dr. Jonathan Wells is, has his PhD in theology from Yale University and a PhD in biology from the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Wells is the author of Charles Hodges' Critique of Darwinism. Perhaps his best known publication is the book Icons of Evolution. He's also published The Politically Incorrect Guide to Darwinism and Intelligent Design. He's published The Myth of Junk, DNA, and the book Zombie Science. Dr. Wells is currently a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute in Seattle in the United States, and we are very fortunate to have him with us today. Welcome, Dr. Wells. Happy to be here, Frank. Fantastic. I'm glad our tech is working well, and um, I've really been looking forward to this. Thanks for giving us the time. Uh, for this. Listeners have uh, heard the brief history of your uh, scholarly background and uh, the work that has occupied your, your investment over the years, but uh, I did not mention in the interview a little bit of our own history, yours and mine. We've worked together in many different capacities over the years, but it's been quite a long time since we've worked together, although we've retained our, our kind of fond friendship in the intervening years. The last time we were more constantly in contact with one another, we had both gone through theological studies. Your work was at Yale University. Mine was at Vanderbilt. And uh, we, had, we were working together on issues related to religion and peace internationally. And then at a certain juncture, in that period of time, you received some sort of a strong call to move in the direction of key issues of uh, science and related, importantly, to theological dimensions of human understanding, even in the scientific field. And you went off to get another degree, a, a, a science degree at Berkeley. Yes. Berkeley. And it's, yes, in biology. And from there, from there, your career 
moved more rigorously along the tracks of science. And that's when you and I had let, uh, that's when you and I didn't go our separate ways artistically, but uh, in career path. I, uh, I've always enjoyed and kept close, close track of your important contribution in the field of, uh, of you were studying primarily human, uh, not, not only evolution, evolution science, or what's the best proper name for that field? Uh, Is it just simply evolution, a, evolutionary biology? Evolutionary biology. And so I kept up with this. It was, it was great work. It was controversial work, right? You always, you always have plenty of enemies. I think every right? Isn't that, uh, I, you don't uh, you don't go in a peaceful in a peaceful universe. You you work at some of the some of the real chal- challenging areas, and I guess uh, there's a lot of fire flying in all directions. Uh, ev- evolutionary biology, and then all of a sudden, just a couple of a couple of days ago or a week ago or so, you said, "Frank, here's my new work. You might." Uh, I got an email from you, and I was shocked. It was an entirely new arena. And, uh, and um, it completely caught me off guard. And so I jumped into it right away, even before contacting you. And uh, I, was, I was riveted by it. So I'll get to, I'll get to my own reaction to that. Uh, but but perha- perhaps you can tell, tell us what, what caused, <clears throat> what happened uh, that you produced an entirely new arena of research. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, please. Be happy to. Uh, I received my PhD from Berkeley in 1995. And uh, since then, most of my work has been focused on embryology and evolution. But then uh, last October, October 2019, I read a newspaper article <clears throat> about a, a family in Texas uh, a court, a Texas court, had just awarded sole custody of a seven-year-old boy to his surrogate mother. His parents had divorced four years earlier. The mother uh, had been trying to convince the boy that he was a girl and putting him in dresses, sending him to school as a girl, and was planning to, uh, as they say, transition him to being a girl physically uh, possibly as soon as the age of nine. His father opposed this, and she went to court and had the court terminate their joint custody of the child. A very sad story, actually. And until that point, transgenderism, which is the topic of the series I just published, transgenderism was not even on my radar. Uh, but suddenly that got my attention. I realized uh, after ignoring it for so long how powerful the transgender lobby has become and how, to what extent the government actually condones it. Mm. And that's what got me started on this. Mm. Very good. So um, you said surrogate mother, but it's his own mom. It's, it's his own mom, right? It's his, it's his mother. Well, she uh, bore him and raised him, but she's, yes. she's not the biological mother. She's not the biological mother. She, you said she bore him? Well, in the womb, you know, she gave birth to him, but yes. he was born from a, a donor egg. I see. I see. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Now I understand. Okay. So, so this was a, this was a perfectly peaceful, happily married couple in Texas and uh, they have fertility problems and they go through the usual agonies and, and side by side, they, they uh, do all the challenging and difficult things and as some might say by god's grace they're blessed with a child uh with a donor egg she she bears this boy and and then they're they're probably excited and happy that they have this young this baby that they never dreamt was possible maybe at times lost hope or whatever they have this boy and then you said by by what age did by what age did the mother come to hold that this that this young fellow should be raised as a girl or become a girl what age was i'm not sure i do know that they divorced when the boy was three okay okay 
All right. And so, and so when when you when you saw that the government that that she files for divorce and they give they give her custody of the boy, sole custody, so that the father's forbidden to be in this young fellow's life at all, or you didn't follow that part of it uh, closely? Well, it's my understanding that when they first divorced, they had joint custody. So the boy, oh, oh, that's right, you said, okay. The boy Carry spent on. part of his time with his father, and according to his father and others, when he was with his father, he lived very happily as a boy. Mm, but then mm. when he went to live with his mother, she started convincing him very early on, trying to convince him that he was a girl, putting him in dresses, and uh, eventually sent him to school as a girl. Yes, and right, you write on this. You write on this uh, family in the sixth, the the sixth of the seven part series. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, very good. So. Um, <laughs> For the for the listeners, this is this is you. This will also you have it in the text. You can uh, click on the links. Uh, it's it, the site is called Evolution News and Science Today. Is it, that is correct, uh, Doctor Wells? That's correct. Okay, Evolution News and Science Today, and um, and there are a, a great many. There are a great many scientific areas on this page where uh, interested people can study about many different areas of science. Uh, and then in, uh, in there, you can find what's called the Transgenderism Series. It's a seven-part series, uh, all produced by uh, Dr. Wells, with, who, who's with us today. Uh, at, first, at first, I thought I was going to have a ton of reading to do, but but it's very, it's very graciously plain, simple reading. It's not hard to get through. It's not, it doesn't have deep and difficult science. You've helped translate that for the lay person so that we can access the issues uh, very quickly and very easily. So uh, after, you ha after you've heard this um, interview, everyone, please be sure to go read these. They're there. Uh, each each of the seven part series is very easy to get through. It's quick to get through, and uh, and you will be well educated uh, in short order from this. So, uh, Doctor Wells, one of the things that I enjoyed or felt this this is gracious or fine or uh, I'm I'm immediately struck by before you even read a single word of your research and of your articles, there's something called author's note. And it's, and it's the first words you read on every single one of uh, your entries, the seven part series. And, uh, and I think it would be good for our listeners to hear this right up front, if you wouldn't mind. I agree. <clears throat> so I'll just read it, it's not long. Mm. Uh, as, as you said, every part starts with this. Nothing in this series is intended to disparage any transgender person, any gender non-conforming person, or any person attracted to members of the same sex. I write as a developmental biologist with a Berkeley PhD, and I focus on evidence pertaining to transgender treatments for children. Wonderful, wonderful. It is, uh, it's so it's so fair, but it it is so true. You 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 write in in simple, plain. There there's almost no advocacy in it. You're just presenting facts and research in the most compassionate and gentle way. Uh, there's no rant in it. There's no kind of wild-eyed um, uh, kind of rage against trends in society. It's just it's just a plain presentation of facts. And, and even so, as I read it, uh, uh, John, I was, I was in pain the whole time. It, I was torn up the whole time. Uh, it just struck me that, that, that people with 
with transgender impulses or issues, or you call gender dysphoria, gender dysphoria, um, they, they struck me as the victims of a kind of rampant and aggressive community that claims to be acting on their behalf, but just seems, I'm struck by a feeling of being the dire enemy of, of these very people that need genuine care and understanding. It's, it's almost, in my reading, I just felt these people, these people who experience gender dysphoria so deserve the finest and, and most uh, towering degrees of embrace, understanding, and, and support. And yet, as I read the research, my feeling was that they're just instruments of an agenda. They're, they're actually the victims <laughs> of the very people that are regarded in society as their champions. I don't know if that's unfair, and perhaps as we speak, you can correct me if I'm wrong or, or refine my sense, but with every line I read, my, it, was, it was wrenching to me. My heart broke again and again, even though I'm just reading plain old everyday medical research and medical facts. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, move, we'll get to this in a moment. I just wanted to give you an opportunity, if you care to, to just explain a little bit about uh, the, the foundation from which your research uh, was, uh, who, for whom you write. I think you're a, a senior fellow uh, with the, is it the Discovery Institute or? Yeah, yes, that's correct. Okay. And do, you, do we need to say a word about what that is? Uh, I think it, it I, I noticed that there's a section on science and a section on culture. It seemed to me that there were six or seven areas of science, one of which is medicine. And that's where this transgenderism series was written in that, in that sector. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, Discovery Institute is a, a nonprofit uh, public policy organization in Seattle uh, with branches elsewhere in the country and the world. And uh, it's probably become most famous for its advocacy of what's called intelligent design in biology. Well, not just biology, but in science. Yes. So that's been very controversial. But it, it has other programs. It has one that uh, currently focuses on the causes of homelessness. Uh, it focuses on uh, things like uh, euthanasia, uh, abortion. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, so most of my work has been in the area of evolution and intelligent design. But as I said, uh, a little over a year ago, I got interested in this issue. Very good. Very good. Okay, that's helpful for a little bit of context. As I read your work and your research in the seven-part series, I, I was struck by the, the feeling that a lot of medical and scientific policy begins, begins with an impulse towards a compassionate, a, a, a compassionate embrace of a minority community that is is easily easily kind of occupies an outcast uh, an outcast type of experience in society or in school or something like that, so that if you are a boy with feminine appearances or feminine uh, experiences or feminine impulses or if um, there the, these such a young person might be picked on or outcast, or even if the other students weren't mean, they would have trouble finding a place in the school, a place they would, who, the right friends, or they couldn't be on teams or, or these sorts of things. It seems like, for example, if you take like any, any kind of wedge issue or controversial, if you take abortion, there's some, there's some poor mother that wasn't raised with good education, that wasn't properly taken care of, finds herself pregnant and 
uh, is 14. And there's always, there's always a certain definition of a type of person in society that is easily just judged or looked down upon or outcast or, or pushed to the side or people are not <laughs> sensitive to their, to their social experience. And then there, be, then there begins to become a community that is concerned about the experience of, of these people who are easily, or presumed anyway, to be judged or cast out. So, so as I was reading what you wrote, it seems that so many of these wedge issue type of areas like transgenderism, it, it starts out out of, a, out of somewhat of a compassionate impulse. Would you is can you speak to that or does that resonate with anything that well it's it's hard for me to address the, the motivations of people involved in this uh, I all I all I try to do in my series is describe the published evidence about what's being done and what's happening mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, boys with feminine behaviors I point out actually in the first part of the series that although biological sex in humans is binary, that is, it's 99.98% uh, either male or female. There are very few exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. uh, those exceptions up until about the 1950s were pretty much able to live their lives in peace. But starting in the 1950s, it became common practice to perform surgery on them to make them more stereotypically male or female. In many cases, uh, for anatomical reasons, this meant uh, converting many baby boys into baby girls, at least externally. In part one of my series, I point out that that is now no longer thought to be wise. In fact, uh, Three Surgeon Generals of the United States published in 2017 uh, a statement that such surgeries should not be performed. Uh, transgender people should be left alone. I'm, I'm sorry, not transgender. Uh, these are called intersex babies that are that they're born with ambiguous genitals. So their their male genitals might be abnormally small, or their female genitals might be very masculine, but they're still usually, in almost all cases, either male or female, and they don't need surgery to change them into one or the other. That's, uh, that's in my first part. But behavior now, there's a, a, a spectrum of behaviors with boys and girls, uh, from the most masculine to the most feminine, and uh, quite a bit of overlap in behavior. So when I say that biological sex is binary, uh, that's not as true in the case of behavior. And you're quite right that uh, boys with feminine behaviors and girls with masculine behaviors should be protected rather than bullied. But that's different from being transgender or having gender dysphoria. With gender dysphoria, the child actually wants to be or thinks he or she is a member of the other sex. And that's quite a distinct phenomenon. And that's mostly what my series focuses on. Okay, thank you. So gender dysphoria is that one, one, want, one, believes, one wants to be or believes they are different than their biological gender, that they, they, they want to be of the sex or the, or the gender other than their biological gender. Is that, is that what's called gender dysphoria? Yeah, I can actually read you the uh, official definition. It's very mm -hmm. short. So in uh, what's called the Diagnostic and Stati Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, published by psychiatrists, gender dysphoria in children is, and this is a quote, a marked incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender and assigned gender, which means biological sex in code. Uh, of at least six months duration. It's accompanied by a strong desire to be of the other gender or an insistence that one is the other gender. And the condition is associated with clinic clinically significant distress or impairment. Uh, so that's gender dysphoria. Now, the use of assigned gender here mm -hmm. 
is due mainly to the work of John Money, psychiatrist or sexologist, not psychiatrist, psychologist, John Money in the 1950s. It was Money who uh, most prominently advocated the idea that gender and sex are different. And he advocated, although he was not a surgeon himself, he was a strong influence in the tendency to perform surgeries on intersex babies. So assigned to sex or assigned gender really means biological sex, which as I said before, is unambiguous in 99.98% of human babies. And so John Money is, is picking this tiny, tiny percentage of human beings that are called intersex. Inter yes. In which, in which the biological sex is not, uh, not radically or 100% unambiguous. It's, there's some ambiguity. It could, but it's not utterly, it's not utterly amb ambiguous, but there's some ambiguity in the, genet in the sexual features of the baby. Yes. Uh, now, there are rare true hermaphrodites, that is, babies who have uh, tissue of both male and female, uh, that is a testicle and, and an ovary or mm, something like mm, that. Mm. That's very rare. Most uh, children with ambiguous genitalia uh, come close to falling in the main categories of male and female. Okay. And so how was it that a single individual would have such a radical impact on global society that suddenly something as radical as surgery suddenly starts to become more abundant or more frequent. How, how, does, how does that happen? That, or or, or have, you, have you attempted to understand what, what were the, set, what were the um, factors which moved society toward this direction, direction where suddenly that becomes a more frequent consideration, a more frequent practice? <clears throat> Well, that's a good question, but I don't think I have the answer. I mean, I, I lived through the 50s and 60s and 70s. I watched the so-called sexual revolution unfold, and uh, I'm not sure I can explain everything about it, but uh, money's ideas uh, became part of that. So it was a larger cultural shift uh, that embraced his ideas uh, until very, very recently. Yes. Now, I'm a little bit worried that my own orientation is not fair to your rigors as a research biologist, because one of my next questions was that when I see these types of matters, what I call wedge issues that have a scientific dimension to them in which suddenly the capacity to converse dispassionately is out the window and people are doing all sorts of raving uh, fury at one another, it, it seems to me that, that, the, that the boundary line, and again, I'm afraid I may, I may be stepping outside of the arena of which you've researched and written, but it seems like the boundary line is materialism. Whether or not, what, like, if the, if the human being is, is a collection of, of manipulable matter, then, then the approach to, then the approach to affairs of gender, reproduction, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, takes on a very mechanical posture or orientation. So that, so that in the in the abortion debate, it's a lump of tissue or something like that, um, and it be, it's almost like. It, it, it's re, one removes it because one can that medicine has advanced to the extent that one can do these things as you said that prior to the 50s the the t infinitesimally small number of cases in which there was uh, uh, intersex you said that they went on to be able to live their lives in peace it's almost it's almost as though these issues arise and take cultural root and so social and, and legislative root simply because 
of the of the sheer just mechanical capacity do this to my car because simply because I can that technology has advanced to this degree that I'm able to organize matter in such a way that I I can and I personally uh, who am new to this area and have been that's why I was so I'm struck by a sense that the, the rise of these types of things, like the increase of transgenderism, is, is always tied down to a material, a certain materialism, that, that this suddenly becomes a part of human affairs simply because it's possible. It's mechanically possible. It's surgically possible. It, it's, 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 one can manipulate matter in such a way that one can add, one can change genitalia. Where, in prior, prior, maybe prior to the 50s, that just wasn't possible to do medically. Can, can you speak to this or am I outside of, again, outside of your, just the rigors of your research? Well, uh, remember, I'm a theologian too. So uh, I, I think you're absolutely right that there's an underlying materialism here that has wide ranging effects, which is why one reason I got in, interested in uh, dealing with evolution, because Darwinian evolution, as opposed to simple change over time, is a materialistic interpretation of uh, how living things have uh, evolved. And uh, I think that materialism is, is a great evil, frankly, philosophically mm -hmm. speaking. Uh, and it certainly has uh, led to this idea that if we, if we can do something that the human body do it. Now, it's, it's important to point out that in transgenderism, the changes are pretty external. You can surgically modify genitalia, but you cannot turn a boy into a girl or a girl into a boy. Biological sex is much deeper mm -hmm. than that. So we're talking about uh, superficial changes, really. Yes. But they are surgically possible. Yes. So this was a little bit where I was going with my initial question is this kind of sympathy for a, a, a minority group that struggles due to, due to the vicissitudes of fate. And so it's, it's kind of like my formula is something like compassion plus materialism is, is a horror movie, is, is equals horror. That's my... Compassion plus materialism equals horror. So, I'd I'd love for the I'd love for the medicine to go as deeply in, as possible into the issues of gender dysphoria, into issues of caring for people, the the rare instances of intersex. Or uh, the beauty of scientific advance is its capacity to uplift the human experience and to and to help and to heal. But it seems to me in each instance that when, that it's, it seems that the material the materialism is that thing which then takes a sweet start, like the start of like a happy uh, a happy start to a movie which suddenly degenerates into horrors. Uh, in one of your I think it's in part in the in the fourth section of your um, uh, f series, the fourth part of your series, you describe an experiment in the Netherlands of, uh, on 36 children between 1993 and 1996. Uh, am I correct on that? Do you recall this? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, you're right. And, and, this, and the sentence here is half of the 36 children were randomly dis assigned to receive treatment. The other half received no treatment. And, and again, you're writing, you have a very beautiful writing style. You're writing in plain, non, non raging language. And, and, but that sentence, uh, uh, that sentence is what, what, what? Th they're just experimenting on children. Am I watching, you know, am I watching the boys from Brazil? What am I, what am I reading here? That th they're experimenting, uh, like, this is the Netherlands. It's not like Idia means, you know, this is my confusion, uh, Dr. Wells. Well, how do we get to the point where they just, they're just experimenting on children? How does this even come to, 
exist in in a civil society in a c- civilized world it, i don't call it it doesn't sound civilized to me well i agree with you uh, although the particular experiment you're referring to in the netherlands uh, was a genuine experiment and the children knew it and their parents knew it it was to correct uh, short stature. These were children who were shorter than their contemporaries. They were receiving growth hormone. It becomes ineffective during puberty, puberty because puberty causes the long bones to fuse. So they stop yes. growing. So for these children who were, as I say, well aware that they were being experimented upon, well, the, <clears throat> the experiment to which you're referring uh, had to do with children of short stature. That is, they were shorter than their contemporaries, and they wanted to grow taller. Uh, so they were temp- they were receiving growth hormone, but growth hormone stops being as effective when puberty starts because of the hormonal uh, things going on. So these children, uh, as you say, randomly chosen half, were put on what's called a puberty blocker. That's a drug that stops puberty. Uh, And my point in that particular part where I described the experiment is that for these children who are very young, uh, the puberty blockers were used for a short period of time to see if they could help the the growth hormone. And then the puberty blockers were stopped. Yes. The children returned to normal puberty and uh, they gained a little bit of height, not enough to make the trouble worth it. I see. But... uh, they they were <clears throat> fully aware that the experiment was going to end that they, they were going to continue on to become normal adults okay so mm. the problem the problem with tran- transgenderism is that the puberty blockers are not used uh, for a short period and they in almost every case lead to long term irreversible changes like hormonal and sexual uh, surgical changes yes so this this experiment was quite different in that okay. sense. Okay, okay, I understand. Because later on in one of one part of your series, you you describe a four part, four stage process that eventually leads to sex change, correct? And the the second yes. one is the use of puberty blockers. Yes, this is called the Dutch protocol, uh, uh, just like this experiment on short stature. Uh, The Netherlands has been the center, in a sense, for uh, transgenderism. And the Dutch protocol, which uh, has become the standard uh, treatment, actually, in many places for children with gender dysphoria, involves four steps. The first step is social transitioning. That is, before puberty, usually, the child is allowed to live as though he or she were a member of the other sex. Then at the very beginning of puberty, the child is put on a puberty blocker to stop the effects of puberty, uh, namely, uh, you know, all the things that happen to a a normal child in the course of puberty. Then at uh, 16, the child who is no longer producing normal hormones is given cross-sex hormones. Boys are given estrogen, girls are given testosterone. And two years after that, at 18, if the child or if the person wants to continue on all the way, they can receive sex change surgery. Yes, yes. And, and, part, of, and part of your research is indicating that puberty blockers in the, in the short term is, is still a reversible stage in what you call the Dutch protocol, this four-part, four-step Yes. Right. And uh, and then you go on to explain how that has changed from the time of the original Netherlands experiment, because while they're on the puberty blockers, there's a, they're also in psychological therapy, kind of working with them on the assumption that they're on, on track to eventually change their um, their born gender, their born gender, right? Their biological gender. Yes. Uh, now, none of the children in the uh, short stature study uh, had gender dysphoria. They, they all wanted to grow up in the body that they were born yes. with. Uh, 
But <clears throat> when we look at the statistics uh, for children with gender dysphoria, and I quote the statistics in, in my series, uh, <clears throat> if a child with gender dysphoria uh, decides not to go on a puberty blocker, there's a three quarters, a better than three quarters chance that that child will grow up to be happy with the body he or she was born in. But once a child starts on puberty blockers, even though the advocates of transgenderism keep saying puberty blockers are totally reversible, the fact of the matter is that when, once children begin on them, there's a better than 98% chance that they will go on to cross-sex hormones and three quarters of them will go on to cross-sex surgery. So the choice to go on a puberty blocker is not uh, buying time, as the transgender advocates say. It's more like the decision to, to go on and completely uh, transition to the other sex. Yes, yes. and that's, that's a linchpin of, of the research you present. There's an important, a very key part of the research you present, I believe, is this is this kind of that exact point on the claim that it's reversible and the statistics which show that there are a number of factors that are moving it moving it into a deeper and deeper point toward the point of non-reversibility i believe in your that's correct i think that's one of the main points of my series yes the uh, <clears throat> the advertising by transgender advocates that, oh, don't worry, this is just a, a pause, you know, you're just buying time to think this over. That is a lie. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, Dr. Wells, again, as I look at this, it seems to me that in so many of these kinds of cases which move toward things that are kind of break norms and kind of undermine traditional roles which are the kind of cornerstone of social life and, and family life, oftentimes it seems like there's a particular individual that after, t after time is shown that the individual ha had ma massive kinds of perversions and sicknesses and, and they have positions that, that their heirs, like if you say transgender advocates, would would excoriate in anybody else and yet they sit peacefully they sit peacefully on the kind of perch of heroism or founder status um like i believe if i'm not mistaken i believe uh margaret sanger was a was uh an extreme like what's it called a ra a, a racial eugenicist or something like that it's uh yes i've read yeah that. um and then there's also uh the, these two sexologists, Kinney and uh, uh, Kin Kinsey. Kinsey, and there were two, right? Uh, Kinsey's the one I remember yeah. the most, but uh, John Money was uh, a follower of Kinsey. Okay, and so I was reading Money, who whom you described as um, as uh, one of the one of the seminal figures in the arising of this trend of of first uh, the, the surgery on intersex babies, and then maybe laying at the foundations of being one of the founders or ins inspirations. Uh, when I was reading about the work of John Money on this, uh, these twins, right? Yes. There was Brendan, uh, can you, what was their names again, please? Well, I can briefly tell you the okay, story. Okay, that'll be great. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, there were two twin boys, identical twin boys, born to a Canadian family in 1965 when the boys went in for a routine circumcision an accident burned off the penis of one of the boys the parents didn't know what to do they finally ended up consulting john money and john money believed that uh, gender identity doesn't even develop in a child until the age of two or two and a half so he convinced the parents to go ahead and have the boy castrated completely and then to raise him as a girl. And he assured the parents that the boy would be very happy in that role. Well, the boy wasn't. He was absolutely miserable. And I go into that somewhat in my yes. series. He never saw himself as a girl. His brother said he never acted like a girl. Uh, but it wasn't until the age of 14 
that his father finally told him the truth on the advice of another psychiatrist. Well, in the meantime, John Money knew that this unfortunate child was unhappy, but he continued to misrepresent this. Now, this was an experiment. This was a, a ghoulish experiment. Yes. And he went on to misrepresent the results as being uh, all in favor of his ideas. So, uh, in effect, Money lied. And it wasn't just his idea on the difference between sex and gender. It was his idea that gender doesn't form right away and that it's okay to uh, do surgery on baby boys that have uh, undergone this kind of horrible accident and that they would be happy, happy to be raised as a girl. Well, he was dead wrong. And so money didn't just have bad ideas. I think, in a sense, he caused a lot of tragedy. Yes. And in, in your section or chapter on money, there's, there's some account of the, of the types of things that went on during those therapy sessions when the children were entrusted in his care and left alone with him that were, that were horrific, in fact, in terms of, of, just the, of just the sheer abuse of these children. That's correct. He, he, uh, he saw this as an ideal experiment because the, it involved identical twin boys, or at least one he now said was a yes. girl. But he was able to compare their behaviors, and uh, when they were left alone with him in his office, according to the boys later in, in later years, he would show them pornographic pictures and even have them strip naked and uh, perform simulated sex acts. Uh, and this is with boys be below the age of yes. 10. Yeah, this was, this was uh, in, that, in that chapter. I forget which one of what, which of the seven, but well, actually, chapters uh, two and three are about okay. money. Okay, and and when I was reading this, I'm wondering. Uh, uh, you heard that with my kind of lay persons and half knowledge, I thought I recall Sanger is it would be a villain by any measure, uh, uh, Kinsey, uh, kind of perverse by any measure. Once once their biographies are known and the types of things you're describing here, uh, with money are is is just villainy by any measure and yet and yet they sit they sit untarnished or or un, un, untouched by those that follow in the subsequent series of, of kind of legislative policy and medical practices uh even such that and this will be my my final set of questions that the whole transgenderism move originates in such dark and heinous places and uh, i know you don't have an answer for this but i wonder wh i wonder why that's never i wonder why that's a safe place for the work for such horrible people that they don't that they they last so long untouched and uh, whereas you know if a, if a uh, you know if a, a priest accidentally you know, got caught with a Playboy magazine or that, that's the greatest news ever. And then you have these kind of people that remain in kind of in hero status. And um, it was just something I was curious. And I, I know it's not an answer you have, but I did want to raise it and see if there's even a thought you have on uh, this <clears throat> kind of matter. Well, money's misbehavior has been exposed in various books and articles. Y yes. Uh, but it's... I think it's the same phenomenon we see in the case of, uh, say, uh, Lenin or Stalin or Castro. Uh, you know, the truth is that they were horrible villains, but they're, the luster attached to them by the materialist left, political left, uh, keeps their false memory alive. Mm. And I think that's true in the case of John Money as mm. well. Mm. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, the, the final thing I wanted, and you know, I could, uh, I wish I, I wish I had, uh, been a better partner, uh, for you. I hope you've felt that you've had a chance to get a lot of your uh, research expressed here. Um, I guess I was coming at it more from a social or cultural reaction to it as a, as a non-scientist, but I'm grateful for 
your clarity. Um, the final thing that I'd like to do is that do you, can you give the listeners what would be a kind of an ideal or happy direction we could start to move or given this, this tiny number of people that, or kind of the growth of gender dysphoria, uh, gender dysphoria. Do you, do you feel that this is the fruits of the growing welcome of it or encouragement of it? Or do you think it's been a thing that people have had, but haven't had a chance uh, to they were they were suppressed or weren't society never allowed such a thing or can, what what's a healthy way for us to think about this phenomenon that you know we don't want to just hate people we don't want to just be against things and uh, if there's a word for what would be what would be a a healthy way for us to wish things were this way uh, given given the types of issues we've discussed here. Well, I'm a great believer in light overcoming darkness. And so, uh, as I've done in this series, I think uh, it's important to get the news out. Uh, one thing I do in this series, if I can boast a little, is uh, I cite a lot of scientific research. Yes. Because I want to focus on the evidence, not just the, the hysteria or the whatever, yes. the phobia it's sometimes called. Yes. <clears throat> but... Uh, and I also focus just on children, or mainly on children, yes. because I think they are really victims here. Right. And uh, I hope parents and medical professionals and politicians uh, learn the truth about this and uh, stop supporting it. Very good. Very good. Very good. Yeah, once again, once again, I, I really commend your remarkable way of speaking in a... In, a, a quiet and measured voice and sticking just just to research and facts and trusting that to speak on its own which it has it's it's powerful to read it and uh and i'm grateful that we've had a chance with you to learn learn more about it and uh and i hope that i hope that this little effort can make some difference uh, and make some lives happier well, I'm grateful to you, Frank, for giving me the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Wells. And uh, we'll be back again, perhaps on another topic sometime soon.